Genesis chapter 28, starting at verse 10. Jacob left Bathsheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. But Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he'd put under his head and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on it, the top of it. He called that place Bethel. Welcome to the 17th of these sermons during the COVID-19 season. Today, instead of talking about the gospel, I want to say a few words about the wonderful Old Testament reading about Jacob's dream. Today's Old Testament story is the start of Jacob's long journey from Beersheba to Haran and back again. This reading is also the start of his even more difficult journey from being a liar, a cheat, and a badly behaved mummy's boy to establishing his reputation as the third of the great patriarchs of Israel. Jacob's real journey is the transformation of Jacob, the self-centered cretin, to the newly named Israel, father of the people who share his name. It's a wonderful story because not only do we see Jacob with all his flaws that are so like our own, we also see the power and the persistence of the God who ne never gives up on Jacob, who is always faithful to his promises. Jacob finds himself in a bad spot. He has to flee his home in Beersheba because he's acted so badly towards his brother Esau that Esau plans to kill Jacob in revenge. Not only has Jacob tricked Esau into selling his birthright as the firstborn son, he's also fraudulently cheated Esau of the deathbed blessing of their father. Rebecca, the mother of the boys, and also Isaac, their father, can see that there's no future for the two boys together. And so they tell Jacob to leave to go to Haran to his mother's brother, Laban, and to marry in his country and to settle there. You recall, if you remember the Old Testament stories, that Haran is where Isaac's servant found Rebekah and put a ring on her nose and brought her back to Canaan to be Isaac's wife. The problem is that Haran is a very long way away and Jacob has to flee without proper preparations. He's really running for his life. We hear nothing about companions to travel with him, although it would be very unusual if he didn't have a servant or two at least to join him. Haran, their destination, is situated between the two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. It's now part of the far eastern edge of modern Turkey. Beersheba, where he starts the journey, is in the very south of the Holy Land, just above the Negev Desert about 650 kilometres one way. Remember, the story is from at least 3,000 years ago. No train to catch, no made roads, just trade tracks, vast wildernesses, where animals were still a threat, and where lonely travellers were good hunting. Robbers and thieves were also on the prowl. Life truly was nasty, brutish and short. So Jacob begins his journey full of anxiety and trepidation. 
Everything he's known and relied on is gone. It's not hard to imagine his remorse for his poor behaviour, his anxiety about the future, and his longing to start again for a second chance. But in spite of all that has gone before, God does give Jacob a gift. As he sleeps, he gives him a clear vision. Jacob, with his head on a stone for a pillow, is given a vision of a ladder populated by angels ascending and descending from heaven. And next to Jacob, God himself appears with words of reassurance. He rehearses the words of the covenant that he has previously made with Jacob's father Isaac and with his father Abraham. I will give you the land on which you lie. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and all the families of the earth will be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. This extraordinary promise in this extraordinary dream, in this extraordinary place, is what keeps Jacob focused for the rest of his life until finally with his wives and children, he does return to this land, a wealthy man but still hungry for the love of his brother. It's only when Jacob finally makes peace with his brother Esau that he can become the focus and fulfilment of God's promises. So the story of Jacob starts today. Alone and afraid, his head is whirling with questions that are not unfamiliar to us. How have I got to this place in my life? What can I do to fix the mess I've made? How can I survive the next days? Why have I been so stupid? How can I cope with this deep sense of anime with the black hole of nothingness? When Jacob wakes from his dream, he declares the place to be Bethel, literally the house of God. He sets up a holy stone, his pillow, and sanctifies it with oil and dedicates the place as a sanctuary. He returns many years later and sacrifices again as a wiser man. Here today, he has really no idea what he's doing. The journey of Jacob's life, driven by a longing to come home, to be reconciled with Esau, to find his true place, asks everything of him. In spite of the many trials of his life, Jacob never forgets that it is God who spoke to him at Bethel. God who is always faithful in spite of our prevarication and our faithlessness. It is at the end of his journey, when Jacob is about to risk all he has built and all he has loved, that he once more meets the Lord, disguised as the stranger with whom he wrestles all night at the river Jabbok. The stranger, the Lord, gives him his new name, Israel, and leaves him with a limp damaged, but he's reborn as the fruit of the promises made so long ago in that first dream at Bethel. I hardly need to spell out the power of this story for us in Victoria in this COVID-19 era. Why are we here? Where are we going? How can we make up for the mess we've made? Time and time again, the patriarchs speak to us not of our own folly, of the righteousness of God. A righteousness not based on justification or restitution or punishment or even reward for meritorious effort, but simply based on God's decision to choose us and to love us and to keep his promises that nothing can stop his love. Long centuries after Jacob, St Paul puts it this way, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. O God, you alone can order our unruly wills and affections. Teach us to love what you command and to desire what you promise. 
that among the changes and chances of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God shown to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, bless you and keep you safe today and always. Amen.